One Man Family, brought to you by the makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee and Blue Bonnet Margarine. One Man's Family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Today we present the opening chapter of Book 65, entitled The Dying Fires of Europe. And now the author has a personal word for you. It will be given to you by Paul. There's a custom of long standing on one man's family of giving an introductory preface at the beginning of each new book. This is not only the launching of a new volume, book 65, but the beginning of a new year. And just as 1948 is a continuation of events which had their beginning in 1947, so this new book of the family is a continuation of events that had their roots in previous volumes. Radio is not like the novel with an opening chapter and the last chapter. It's more like time itself, without beginning or end. It's not unlike your own life, which is tied up with things and events, and a society which have their headwaters back in the far years before you were born, and which will continue on long after you are gone. That is radio. It is strange even to me, the author, to realize that there are young people 16 years old today who were yet unborn when one man's family was first heard on the air. That there are parents today who heard their first family show as small children, adolescents. That a whole generation has grown to maturity, and a second generation is well on its way, all within the lifespan of one man's family. I should be more cognizant of all this, perhaps inasmuch as marriage, birth, divorce, and death have been among the cast members who make up the characters of the Barber family. But it is hard to realize how much water is passing under the bridge when you sit on the bank and keep your eyes fixed continually on one little eddy or whirlpool. And now, just for my own ears to hear their voices, I would like to have a roll call of all the people who have been with the show since its inception, which will be 16 years in April. Ken, will you do the honors? Mother Barber? Yes, I'm here. Henry Barber. Yes, yes. Paul. Present. Hazel. Yes, present. Clifford. I'm here. And Jack. Present and accounted for. Thank you. There are others, of course, of equal importance to the show, but these are the six voices which read the very first words of the very first script 16 years ago. I have found wonderful satisfaction in them as I... No, the great radio audience has by its never-ending friendliness and loyalty. And in 1958 and 1965, I know of no reason why we should not all yet be associated. End of author's preface. <laughs> Here's coffee with flavor as fresh and new as 1948. It's improved taste in Sanborn, the most satisfying coffee you ever tasted. So taste it. Taste it now. Yes, this year starts with new coffee delight, a new coffee experience, because our expert blenders have discovered a new combination of finer coffees. Only now is the flavor possibility of these richer coffees fully developed, fully realized, and only Chase and Sanborn gives you this inspired new combination. Taste it. As the man says, that first swallow is like money from home. And the lady who does the shopping may add that it's the richest, most flavorful coffee money can buy. And fresh. Every pound of the new Chase and Sanborn, with its flavor multiplied in the blending, is vacuum-packed as soon as it's perfectly roasted. No other container can possibly give you so much flavor, so much downright coffee satisfaction. Ask your grocer for improved Chase and Sanborn, the coffee sensation of 1948. <laughs> Between laughter and irritation, the Barber clan in Seacliff, San Francisco, is still putting up with Cousin Jediah. They're torn between throwing him bodily off the premises and trying to absorb him into the family circle. Father Barber says... If he'd only settled down to minding his own business and stop calling me Hank, I could at least tolerate him. Mother Barber says... Sometimes I'm amused and sometimes I could shake him until his teeth rattle. He's never offered to leave, nor to pay one cent or his upkeep. On the other hand, he's Johnny on the spot when I need an errand round or a household task done. And we certainly have room to spare now that so many of the children have homes of their own. And so Cousin Jediah stays on. 
That's in San Francisco, but far to the other side of the world, an unidentified, uncharted plane has been making a devious flight from Accra, Africa, northward. It came to rest in the dark of a moonless night in Istanbul, Turkey. It hesitates, only a breathing space, and then it cut back to Athens, Greece. Then a secret stop at Trieste, and finally swooped down on a runway outside of Nuremberg, Germany. It was not a large plane, as planes go today, and only two people with proper credentials were aboard. Paul Barber was at the controls. Nicolette Moore was his companion. Having arrived, they reported to the proper American military authorities and received an assignment of quarters suitable to their purpose. Yeah, suitable to our purpose. They could have had a little heat and still been suitable to our purpose. You are not alone, Paul. All Europe is cold this winter. It wasn't too cold in American military headquarters. Uh, a lot of good we would accomplish living at military headquarters. You know, Nicolette, I'm beginning to wonder if Patricia Baldwin's going to be worth it all, even if we ever do catch up with her. You think we will not? Well, what have we got to date? Oh, you have been going too hard. You know, you are not fully recovered from the weakness of the shock and hurt and the explosion. Well, I'm just tired. Of course. I did not know that you were going to pilot the plane from Accra. I thought you were meant to be an invalid passenger. How many people are we supposed to let in on our manhunt? Please, you sit in the chair with the blanket around you. I will make you some hot soup. Out of what? <laughs> I need my old shoes, and yours aren't big enough or fragrant enough for a really good soup. Oh, no. <laughs> Not old shoes. Why do you suppose I stopped at the military supply store and the Red Cross canteen? By the way, did I ever tell you I had an adopted daughter? Oh? You're just saying Red Cross, recall? Yeah. I had the alcohol store going. See, four cups of water with this packet soup. You're not listening to me. But of course I'm listening. Uh, I mentioned Red Cross, and that made you think of your adopted daughter. Why? Because she's a trained nurse with the Red Cross. Oh? Where? Here in American-occupied Germany. Munich, the last I heard. But that is wonderful. Then you will see her. Hmm? You think so? I don't know. No, perhaps not. Not until we have accomplished our business, at least. What is her name? Oh, this weather. This is some change in San Salvador and Accra, no? Yeah, your hands are blue. It's cold. But this is the kind of weather I have known most of my life. What is your daughter's name? Teddy. Teddy Barber. That is, she was officially adopted, but since she's out in the world on her own, I suspect she's returned to her family name, Teddy Lawton. Oh? Mm -hmm. Why would she do that? Well, don't we all want to return to our true selves eventually? <laughs> That is a very wise observation. No matter what we have been or accomplished, in the end, we secretly wish to return to our true selves. Ah, the coffee is bubbling. The soup is almost ready. Hold your hand over the flames and get some color back in them. Yes, this is a poor German cottage indeed. The wind comes under the door. The frost creeps in under the window sills. Well, we asked to be assigned a place among the working class in the suburbs. And... Hmm. I wonder why. Do you have any ideas? Well, I suppose a person who's to report to us would look conspicuous in any other surroundings. Huh? When is he to report? <laughs> that we don't know. We simply sit here and wait. Is that it? That's it. Somebody knows where Patricia Baldwin is and somebody's ready to talk for a prize. The thing that titillates my imagination is the fact that Patricia Baldwin was a nurse in this very town of Nuremberg before she began her trip home to the United States. She apparently was kidnapped off the boat at Accra and returned to this general area. Here, the coffee is hot. Mmm, that's fragrant, too. Mm, yes. With coffee and the soup, we will be warm and comfortable. Then our minds will be clear to think. Yeah. Patricia Baldwin, an army nurse in Nuremberg. Teddy, a Red Cross nurse in Munich. Nicolette, do you suppose they knew each other? So? And suppose they did? I don't know, I don't know. But I think I'm going to have Teddy brought here undercover for questioning. Out in his beloved garden on the seacliff edge of San Francisco Bay... Father Barber has just completed a flower bed for early spring planting and is at the moment on his knees setting out the delicate young plants. Hey, Daisy, give me well, the hand. Oh, 
There you are, you cantankerous, beloved old character. Looks everywhere for you. Yeah, did you easy. Look to the library. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. In your bedroom. Did you easy. Look to the cellar. Well, uh, I wasn't there. Look behind the furniture. Yeah. What would I be doing behind the furniture? <laughs> Don't tell me, Hank. I know what a slippery character you are when you're hiding. Hiding, indeed. I know what a slick character you are. But I found you. Yeah. Got a good nose. There's plenty of it. Nose like a bloodhound. Yeah, also a vocal quality. Like a lame brain bloodhound. Yeah. Why don't you go over in the vacant lot down the street and, and talk to Hank and Pinky? Who? Hank and Pinky. Who are they? You know Hank and Pinky. Do I? They're Hazel's twins. They're down in the vacant lot with some other boys. Now, why don't you go talk to them? What for? Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> uh, you're a character, Hank. You know that. I'm doing what character there ever was one. Yes, yes. You know what I got here? No. You know what I got here under my arm? Didn't you hear me say no? Well, sit back on your hutches and have a look. I've got to get these plants in before night. Memory book full of picture postcards. Huh? Picture postcards? Picture postcards from all over the lame brain country. Yeah, you collect picture postcards? From all over the lame brain world. Been collecting them for years. Look, there's one from San- Sacramento. Yeah, yeah. That's up the road here, about 90 miles. Picture of the M Street Bridge over the Sacramento River, it says underneath. Yeah, very instructive, aren't you? Bridge is open to let a boat through. Yeah. Pretty soon it'll close to let traffic through. Uh, by George, uh, Cousin Jedi, I just had an idea. You know who'd get a lot of pleasure out of your memory book? Who? Clifford. No. Yes, he would. No. I know better. He's in the library inside writing a letter. Now, take it in and show it to him. Well, now, that's mighty pleasant of your Headley. Mighty pleasant. Go ahead. Uh, take it into Clifford. Gladly, gladly. Yes, you can probably spend the whole afternoon with Clifford if you work at it. Oh, excuse me, Cliff. Are you busy? Oh, just trying a letter. And then he come in. I'm on my way up to the sewing room to see Mother. Go out ahead. Don't let me bother you. No, don't run off. How things over at your place? Oh, Daniel's down at his office. Hank and Pinky are out at the vacant lot. And Margaret's over sitting with Jack and Betty's daughters. Mm, so you were free to pay a call, huh? Mm-hmm. But don't tell me you've moved back over to the family home from Nicky and Claudia's. No, only this afternoon Claudia was giving a bridge party or something just as horrible. So Nicky fled to the Sky Ranch and I invited myself over here. Yes, I know. Well, you go on with your letter. I've got half an hour to spend with Mother. Well, drop by for a minute on your way out. All right. Uh, let's see. And as my young son is soon to be adopted by my sister and her husband, and I am foot loose and without. Obligated. Oh, there you are, Clifford. Oh, trapped. There you are, Clifford. Right in the middle of a letter, I'll bet a sugar cookie. Right on the nose of first guess. Right in the middle of a half-wit letter, I'll bet a Jim Dandy. Check. I'll pull up a chair right up alongside so as we can be comfortable. Well, hey, what, what about my letter? Always believe in comfort. Makes a man live longer. Well, you, uh, you think that's necessary? Makes a man live longer. Comfort's a great thing. Uh, we're not repeating ourselves, are we? Always believed in it. Look, um, couldn't we carry on, uh... My father always believed in it. Yeah, I know, and your grandfather always believed in it. Clifford, he was there. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. No. Uh, we wouldn't be getting in that rut, would we? Uh, what have you got there? Oh, memory book. Picture postcard. Oh, yeah? From everywhere. Look, here's one from Peoria. Here's one from Yellowstone. Here's one from Schenectady, New York. Hmm, Schenectady. Oh, we got one from there, too? <laughs> Let it lay. And here's one from Bangor, Maine. Kind of tore at the bottom. Says, famous old something house of Bangor, Maine. Too bad it's tore. Famous old uh, house of Bangor, Maine. Well, how about Cliff House? Famous old Cliff House. Could be, maybe, except there ain't no cliffs. Hey, um, how did you happen to come in here and show me your memory book, anyway? Your father sent me. Dad told you to come in here? Busy himself, but said you'd be mighty pleased. Mm, he did, did he? Uh, look, Cousin Jediah, you know who would be awfully interested in your memory book? Who's that? I just saw my brother Jack pass by the window. Jack? Who's he? Well, you know, Jack and Betty. They live just across the hedge. Fine couple, fine couple. Yeah, well, 
Why don't you take your book over there? They, they'd love it. Of course they would. Of course they would. Well, that's a good idea. Take it over. Huh? Gladly, gladly. You're a good boy, Clifford. A good boy. <laughs> it's a dirty trick. And Jack's a lawyer. He ought to be able to handle any situation. Hello, who's that? Hey, don't tell me we've got a babysitter again. It's only me, Uncle Jack. Oh, hello, Margaret. Where's your Aunt Betty? Oh, she's over to Aunt Claudia's to a coffee clutch. Oh, what? Well, that's what Aunt Claudia calls it. Most people call them tea parties, but Aunt Claudia calls it a coffee clutch. Mm-hmm. Hazel over there, too? No. No, they're going to play bridge, and Mom says she'd rather lose an arm than have to play bridge. That's the way Grandmother feels, too. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, the daughter's all down for the afternoon. Mm-hmm. I came over early and helped Aunt Betty tuck them in. They'll wake up pretty soon. Aren't you home, darling? Mm, I had to see a client out in this neighborhood, so I just didn't go back to the office. Now, what's in the refrigerator? Hey, you better not get into anything. Well, why not? Mm, sorry. You better stay out of that. Why, it's my ice bar. Maybe Aunt Betty was planning to have that silly for dinner. Uncle Jack, not that sausage. Why not? It was left over from breakfast. But I heard Aunt Betty say she was going to make some meat sauce and spaghetti and have that sausage for tonight. Mm, want some? I should say not. <sighs> Just what a man needs after a hard day at the office. But I have some. And how do you tell Aunt Betty I got into her refrigerator? I should say not. It's my refrigerator, too. Besides, I'll take all the blame. You say it's yours, but it isn't. Hey. Not really. Well, I like that. Who bought it? Yes, but who keeps it clean? Who keeps it full of food? Who has to live with it? Hey, you're not putting your coat on, are you? Yes, and you owe me 50 cents for staying with Elizabeth Sharon Ann and Janie and Mary Lou. Aren't you going to wait till Betty gets back? And have a look in her refrigerator. No, sir. Don't want to be here when this storm breaks, huh? Oh, no. Could I have my 50 cents, please? I really shouldn't pay you. Supposed to come out of Betty's household money. However, let's see. Quarter, three nickels, four, nine pennies. Here you are. I'll deduct it out of Betty's household allowance next week. But that's only 49 cents. 49? 50? What's a penny between blood relatives? I don't usually get 49 cents. Well, look, I turned my pockets inside out. You stripped me down to the last penny. Honest? If you don't believe me, you try to raise three daughters on a rising young attorney's pay. But what about tomorrow? Payday. Oh. Boy, is that a welcome sound. Payday. Oh, there's Aunt Betty. Well, well get the stuff back in the refrigerator. Why don't you put the dishes in the sink there, Auntie? Hand me the cream pitcher. It's empty. Never mind. There. Go answer, will you? But Uncle Jack, I'll I... will be sitting here casually looking at the afternoon paper. <laughs> well, all right. I'll let her in on my way out. She must have forgot to take her key with her. Just say I'm home. Don't say anything else. <laughs> Eating all the dinner up in the middle of the afternoon. Oh, it's you. Good afternoon, Jack. Cousin Jediah, I'm not Jack. Oh, of course you're not. You're little Claudia. <laughs> oh, I'm Margaret. Claudia Margaret. Give me time, I'll get it right. Claudia Margaret, beautiful child. Did you want to see Uncle Jack? Gladly, gladly. Well, he's in the kitchen. I'm going home. No. Well, if you want Uncle Jack, he's in the kitchen. I've got to go now, no matter what you think about it. Goodbye, Claudia Margaret. Goodbye, little girl. Goodbye. Sweet child. Now, where's that young fellow Jack hiding? Well, Jack! Come on out to wherever you are. Hey, Cousin Jediah, for the love of mine. Hide it on me. Come on out wherever you are. Hey, quiet, will you? You want to wake up all the daughters? Somebody asleep? Yeah, my three daughters. Come on to the kitchen where we can close the door. Gladly, gladly. There, that's better. Now you can talk normal. One of your daughters booing. Well, you don't have to talk in a whisper. I got my voice slipped down under low and I can't shift them back my... <laughs> there she is. Guess my throat gears are kind of rusty. Throat gears? Certainly throat gears. How else could a person shift his voice from whisper to ordinary talk to yelling? Gears in the throat, that's how. <laughs> Pull up a chair. You don't mind sitting out here in the kitchen, do you? Don't mind it a bit. Not a bit of it. What's that book you got? Memory book. Oh? Clifford said you'd be mighty interested. Who? Clifford. Full of picture postcards from all parts of the world. Yeah? Tacoma, Washington. Uh-huh. Pittsburgh, PA. Yeah. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, Baton Rouge. There's one up north. What's that? Uh, Baton Rouge, not Baton Rouge. You were there? No, as a matter of fact, I never Baton was. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Bismarck, North Dakota, Omaha, Neb. Omaha, what? 
Neb, M-E-B, Neb. I never heard of a state in the Union called Neb. Yeah, yeah. There it is, right on the postcard. Omaha, N-E-B, Neb. Wouldn't be an abbreviation for Nebraska, would it? What's that you say? I say it wouldn't be an abbreviation. Why, of course it would, son. Of course it would. Such ignorance. Naturally, it's a shortcut for Nebraska. Now, uh, look here at this picture of the state house of Helena, Montana. Noble pile of bricks. And two befores. Cousin Jediah, have you shown this to my mother? Who? My mother. You know, Fanny Barber. Oh, sweet woman, Fanny. Beautiful character. Lovely woman. Yeah, but have you been up to her sewing room and shown this memory book to her? No. No, I ain't. And that's a fact, Jack. Well, I'll bet you'll get some real appreciation out of her. You think so? If I were you, I'd get right back over to the family home and get to her before she has to start dinner. A fine woman, Fanny. Sure, but you better hurry. Gladly, gladly. I got a postcard from Tallahassee, Florida. I'll take a look at that. Picture of a crocodile sunning himself in a swamp. <laughs> Here comes Cousin Jediah, Mother. I wondered what you were watching. It was just a beautiful view out your sewing room window. It always intrigues me. Goodness, Cousin Jediah seems in a tearing hurry. He's the busiest busybody you'll likely find in many a day. And yet he's sincere and kindly about everything. I don't think he'd ever hurt anyone intentionally. Well, you know about the road to hell being paved with good intentions. <laughs> Do you suppose he's just settled down here to stay indefinitely? I haven't the faintest idea. Fanny! Where are Fanny? Uh-oh. You might as well ask her, Fanny. I know you're up in the sewing room. We're about to be invaded. Yes, Jediah, I'm here. Uh, hiding out on me. But you can't hide from Jediah X Marver. We've been here all the time. Oh, dear, dear Hazel. I'm afraid I am. Glad to have you visit us. Oh, glad to have you. Come over and see us any time. Is that right, Fanny? <laughs> glad to have her come over and see us any time. Of course, Jediah. <laughs> Cousin Jediah, what's that you have under your arm? Memory book. Full of picture postcards. Really? Postcards from everywhere. I didn't know you collected postcards. I suppose acquaintances sent them. Yeah, acquaintances sent them. Mm, how nice. Friends sent them. Mm, I see. Enemies sent them. <laughs> What are you doing corresponding with your enemies? They were the blank spaces. Oh? The ones I sent back. <laughs> Indeed. I don't see any from out of continental United States. Yeah, continental United States. Every place. I say you don't see them. Every place all over the world. Tallahassee, Florida, Portland, Oregon, just to me. It's too bad we don't know where Paul is. Who? Paul. He's somewhere out of the country, and if we could get in touch with him, we could have him send you cards from many strange places. Who? Oh, well, I heard of him. Oh, of course you have. He's my eldest brother. You mean Fanny's got more children yet? <laughs> well, you've never seen Paul, Cousin Jediah. Well, fetch him up. Let's have a look at him. We can't. Paul's on secret service work in some closely guarded part of the world for the United States government. No. I'm afraid he is. Paul was hoping to be back for Christmas. It must be more serious than he thought. Oh, are you as cold as I am, Nicolette? We are each rolled up in two blankets, which is all we have. Tonight is dropping well below zero. You're not shivering the way I am. You are recovering from an injury. You have not your full strength back. Besides this, I am a daughter of cold and hunger. I am hardened to bitter weather. <laughs> the poet who said the fires of Europe are going out one by one knew what he was talking about. Huh? He knew. I lie here feeling as though all the firewood in the world had been consumed, as though there was no more coal, no more gas, no more fuel oil. Yes. So far as you and I are concerned tonight, my friend, we might as well be lying on the floor of a windy cave, back in the dark ooze of the Neanderthal man. The whole of Europe shivering in its thin blankets. It's savage. It's uncivilized. <laughs> For you and me, it's only an interlude, Paul. We will accomplish our purpose here and return to the land of plenty. But all those others, what of them? How can anyone swallow his food or sleep peacefully in his bed at night thinking about it? Nothing but this to look forward to, so long as they care to live. Live? This isn't even existing. I wonder if this is the sort of thing Teddy's been putting up with. You got word through to her she's coming here? Mm, the military's taking care of it. I noticed when I mentioned the name Patricia Baldwin, a blank, puzzled look came over the commander's face. Yes, I noticed. Well, if you bring your adopted daughter, Teddy. Shh, listen. 
Someone is outside the window. Why knock at the window instead of the door? Never mind. We have a visitor already. A woman. Woman? No one but a woman would tap on the window with her fingertips just that way. Get me out of this blanket. That must be Teddy. is polishing up his courtroom technique with Cliff on the witness stand. Now, Mr. Barber, I want you to tell the court, in your own words, exactly what happened on the morning in question. Well, I lifted the cup to my lips. What was in that cup? Oh, the new Chase and Sanborn coffee. Ah. You can say that again. Ah. Mm. Uh, had you ever tasted this new brand before? I think carefully. I never had. This was your very first swallow? Yes, it was. Well, Mr. Barber, perhaps you'll be kind enough to tell the court what happened then. What were your sensations? What did you think as the improved Chase and Sanborn greeted your palate and tickled your taste buds? Well, that's very difficult to put into words. Was it like getting money from home? <laughs> Why, yes, come to think of it, like an unexpected check in the mail. You were surprised. I was delighted. You were pleasantly shocked. I was amazed. You never knew coffee could be that good. I did not. It was a new coffee experience. Gentlemen of the jury, get a pound of the new Chase and Sanborn. Make the coffee and taste it. Our case rests on that. <laughs> well, the verdict is already in from millions of homes. The new Chase and Sanborn is the most satisfying coffee you ever tasted. Every pound is vacuum packed, so you get it at its best and freshest. Ask your grocer for improved Chase and Sanborn, the new coffee sensation. <laughs> You've just heard Chapter 1, Book 65 of One Man's Family, written and produced under the direction of Carlton E. Morse for the makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee and Blue Bonnet Margarine. Chapter 2, entitled Teddy Barber After Two Years, will come to you next week at this same hour. All through the new year, it will pay you well to remember this. Remember the letter M-M-E, the flavor of the creation of the economy. And what a wealth of nutrition you get in Blue Bonnet. No other spread for bread is richer in food energy, richer in vitamin A the whole year round. No wonder Blue Bonnet is so good for growing youngsters, the whole family. For here's what you get in only three half-ounce pats of Country Sweet Blue Bonnet. As much food energy as a medium lamb chop. As much precious vitamin A as you get in three glasses of milk. Or as much vitamin A as you get in three fresh eggs. Plus vitamin E and other food essentials. Get Blue Bonnet tomorrow, made by the makers of Fleischmann's Yeast. This week, you save up to 50 cents a pound when you buy Blue Bonnet instead of the expensive spread. And Country Sweet Blue Bonnet is rich in nutrition, rich in energy. Buy Blue Bonnet, yes, for Flavor, comes to you from California. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.